Sheena J from Kerala, India asks, how to make my son love spelling? Hi, this is Thomas with Cozy Grammar, speaking to you from in front of Marie's Cozy Beach Cottage on a very windy discovery passage uh, on Vancouver Island in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Uh, I'm delighted to have you joining me for this session of Ask Cozy Grammar. These are sessions that we hold live online for our students, and then we record the answers so that we can share them uh, afterwards. Uh, I'm particularly excited about this question coming from Kerala because one of my collaborators, the artist C.F. John, who currently lives in Bangalore, is originally from Kerala, and I have very fond memories of going with C.F. John to his native place in Kerala and spending time with his extended family in that very beautiful state in India. This question is a wonderful question. Uh, how to make my son love spelling? It's a wonderful question because it centers on the question of love. Uh, it's not about how to get someone to learn spelling or to understand spelling or to memorize spelling, but it's about how to get someone to love spelling. And that's a beautiful way to look at it because once somebody loves spelling, then of course they will learn spelling and come to memorize spelling when necessary and come to understand spelling. Without the love, uh, there isn't really any real learning. So I love that this question is about love. I've addressed similar questions in previous Ask Cozy Grammar sessions, uh, and I'll give you some links to those previous answers, but here I'd like to answer uh, you directly, Sheena, with three suggestions that occur to me as I sit here in front of Marie's Cozy Beach Cottage. Here is my first suggestion. Approach spelling with all of the senses. That means listening to the sounds of words engaging our sense of hearing. That means not just reading words silently with our eyes, but also saying words out loud. This gives us a way to experience the words in our mouths and in our, and in fact, in our whole bodies. We get to taste these words with our tongues, with our mouths. Uh, and then we get to hear the sounds of those words as our own voices say those words. Along with looking at the words, I really encourage spending time examining the patterns of the letters, not just the word as a whole, but the shapes of the individual letters. Because letters are so common, and we look at them often all the time, sometimes we don't spend time to examine the shapes, the forms of letters. Uh, and then even touching these words, and by that I mean uh, if they are words that refer to things in the uh, the tangible world, uh, experiencing those words to connect the experience of that word with uh, what the word name. So for instance, here in front of uh, Marie's Cozy Beach Cottage, uh, there's a great deal of wind coming in off of Discovery Passage. So if I was learning the word wind for the first time, I would be able to connect the word wind with the feel of the wind as it touches my face, as it, as it blows through my hair, as I feel the, the slight chill of the wind on my hand. Um, the more we can engage all of our senses when we explore not just the spelling of words, but the meaning of words and all of those different layers, the more uh, the language becomes something that's alive, just as the world around us is alive. That's my first suggestion to approach spelling with all of the senses. My second uh, suggestion, Sheena, is to explore the history of words with a good dictionary. Get curious about where words come from, because learning about the history of words, learning about the etymology of words, can help us understand clues as to why they're spelled the way they are. Here is an example. Uh, in English, we have the word mango, M-A-N-G-O, mango. Uh, and my own associations, if we're speaking about these sensory associations with words, my own associations with mangoes go to uh, the island of Maui in Hawaii, where my grandparents, my mother's family, lived. And my grandparents, my, my, my mother's family, comes originally from Okinawa. And when they settled on Maui in Kahului, uh, 
one of the things they did when they built their home was they planted a mango tree in the backyard. And so my association with the taste of a mango, with the sight and the smell of a mango is with that mango tree in my backyard. However, I also lived in Tamil Nadu in South India for a total of five years, where I learned that the word for unripe mango happens to be mongai. And then the word for ripe mango is mongbalam. But notice that the word for unripe mango, mongai, is quite similar to the word for mango in English, mango, mongo, mango. You can start to hear the similarity. Furthermore, if you look in a good dictionary like the Oxford English Dictionary or the Webster's Dictionary, Merriam-Webster Dictionary, you'll see that the word mango actually comes from Malayalam, the language spoken, in fact, in your own state. Because mango entered English by way of Portuguese, because Portuguese traders in Kerala first discovered the fruit that we call mango uh, there, uh, where in Malayalam, I'm presuming, I don't know Malayalam as, the way that I know Tamil, but that in Malayalam, there's a very a word that's quite similar to, to Mongai, Mambala, uh, and um, Mongai, Mongo, Mango, enters Portuguese, and then that enters uh, English, and then now we have mangoes in the supermarket, and that's why we call them mangoes. So knowing this history can tell us something about the spelling of words and even just spending time with words, whether through their characteristics or whether through their histories, starts to embed the um, experience of the word, both its sound and its spellings, into our deeper memory so that we've already learned the spelling of the word. We haven't had to try to learn the spelling of the word. Here's another example about the history of words. Uh, in English, we have the word catamaran which is the name for a kind of boat, which often has at least one or two pontoons along the sides. Catamaran, interestingly enough, also comes originally from a Tamil word, katamaram. Katta in Tamil means to tie or to bind. Maram means tree or a log. So a katamaram, it happens to be a boat made from binding or tying logs together. And you can see the connection between katamaram and katamaran. Here's my third suggestion, Sheena. Find your own ways, your own unique, peculiar ways to remember strange spellings. For example, I'm here in front of Marie's cozy beach cottage. Uh, and the word cottage is C-O-T-T-A-G-E. Now, if you just heard the word cottage out loud, you might think cottage, C-O-T-A-G. That would be a more phonetic spelling of the word cottage, C-O-T-A-G. And in fact, in Old English, it used to be spelled C-O-T-A-G. However, now in contemporary standard English, we spell it C-O-T-T-A-G-E. Now suppose this was confusing to you. This is just a, an example. But suppose it was confusing to you and you wanted to find a way to remember the correct spelling of cottage. But you might think, okay, uh, well, we have caught and we have edge. So we break it down into syllables, cottage. And you might think, okay, well, a cottage might have a cot in it. So it's easy enough to remember the cot. But this cot has two T's and not just one. So uh, maybe you need some way to remind yourself that cottage has two T's instead of one. So here's one way. You might imagine that in your cottage, there's a cot and Marie is sitting on the cot drinking a cup of tea. So we have our cot and we have our letter T reminding us of the experience of drinking tea. So now we've taken care of our C-O-T-T. -T. And now how about this word? How do we remember the silent E at the end of cottage? Well, here's an example. If you take uh, the A-G-E by itself, it makes the word age. We know, let's, let's assume we know how to spell the word age. So then we might think caught age. And you might make a sort of mental, secret mental note to ourselves. Oh yeah, cottage is spelled caught age. Now you wouldn't actually pronounce the word caught age when you're speaking about a cottage. But if you say your, that, that to yourself two or three times, it'll go into your mind and you'll just start to think, oh yeah, cottage. It's spelled like cottage, C-O-T-T, -T, a-D-E. 
that's just one example of the way you can sort of make up your own sort of fanciful associations that actually work to work on the way that our minds associate ideas to help us remember the spelling of an unusual word. In other words, make the language your own. When you encounter words that have strange spellings, make up your own completely fictitious or fanciful reasons for how to put those spellings together and you'll have the words at your command in no time. So I hope, Sheena, that that gives you a couple ideas for how to help your son to love spelling. If you have any further questions, feel free to write to me again um, and I'll see what I can do to help. Thank you.